Welcome to anyone who is joining us via the public webcast today and on the telephone, which I'll get to in a moment. Bonjour, bienvenue au français, en personne, et par la web émission publique. I want to start by recognizing that we're here together in Toronto, which is a Mohawk word that means where there are trees standing in the water, and to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, and also to acknowledge the Haudenosaunee, the Métis and Inuit, and all First Nations peoples with whom we share our lands in peace. Uh, once we determine who is on the telephone, I will let everyone know that we're replacing those coming <coughs> into the meeting in what we call election mode. I'm going to say this carefully because I gather there are quite a few people on the phone today, so there may be some who aren't as familiar with it as others. This means that from our end we will be muting you. Once muted, you will be able to hear the meeting, but you will not be able to speak, or you can talk to yourself. <laughs> so it is star six five. We, of course, will need to come out of lecture mode to hear you when you uh, hear those who wish to speak and vote. And we will do that following the publications or pres sorry, the presentations of reports and motions. At that time, that's when we take you out of lecture mode. Um, unless you wish to speak, please star six your telephone uh, so that we don't hear you. And we'll repeat this periodically on the, on the, uh, during the meeting. So I'd like to go to the list of those who are on the telephone, and I'll read out those who I'm told are on the phone, and then we'll see who we've missed. Peter Beach? Yes, the President. Paul Copeland? Yes. Kathy Corsetti? Yep, here. Neil Finkelstein? Patrick Furlong? Carol Hartman? Good morning, Treasurer. Good morning, Jeffrey Lem? President. Marion Lippa. Present. Sandra Nishikawa. Present. Jan Richardson. Present. Clayton Ruby. Gerald Sheff. Present. Harvey Strasberg. I'm here. Great. <laughs> Roger Iacchetti. And Vesprey. Present. Is there anybody I missed that's on the telephone? Brian Laurie. Brian Laurie, thank you. And Joe Gloria is here. Mr. Gloria. Anybody else? Good, thank you. So I would like to start uh, by welcoming our guest today. Joining us. The conference is in lecture mode. And joining us from the Law Society of Manitoba is Roberta Campbell, the president of the Law Society of Manitoba. Ms. Campbell was called to the Manitoba Bar in 1995 and is a founding partner of Campbell Gunn Innes, a criminal law firm established in 2007. She has been a bencher of the Law Society of Manitoba since 2010 and was elected president in April 2016. And she'll be addressing us in a few minutes. Uh, with her is Kristen Dangerfield, the chief executive officer of the Law Society of Manitoba, who assumed that role in November 2014. Prior to that, she served as Senior General Counsel to the Law Society, and as I know well, was pre previously in private practice in Winnipeg at Thompson, Dorfman, and Sweatman. So welcome to both of you. We look forward to hearing from you. And um, Roberta and Crystal will also be joining us uh, for lunch. Also in attendance, I believe, from Law Pro, are Kathleen Waters, President and CEO, and Steve Jorgensen, Chief Financial Officer. Good morning. And as well, I believe we have Sadia Khan. Yep. There she is. Of PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP, a representative of the Law Society's auditor. Um, Mr. Hull, I believe, is here. There we are. Thank you. Good morning, Ian. The Chair of the Law Society Foundation is also present this morning, so we'll be addressing matters relating to that as well. I'd like to update you on a few highlights of the Law Society's activities. First, I'd like to start by congratulating Michelle Haig for being elected the Paralegal Standing Committee and the, by the committee as chair of the committee this year. As you know, the election of the chair occurs annually and is required under the Law Society Act. So congratulations, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, we also <laughs> had... Uh, I saw a wave down there. Yesterday, we also had the welcome reception for newly licensed paralegals. For those of you who are not able to attend, both Jose and I spoke to the fact that 
2017 marks the 10th year of paralegal regulation. It was on May 1st, 2007 that the enabling legislation came into effect and the Law Society's grant parenting process began. Now, 10 years later, we regulate, as of April 21st, 8,311 paralegal licensees. This is a significant milestone. No doubt the implementation of paralegal regulation has had its challenges, but regulation has been tremendously successful in establishing a licensing process and standards of competence, implementing a complaint and discipline process, and making legal services more accessible and improving consumer services and public protection. Justice Boncalo's Family Law Services Review was released since our last meeting. As we all know, the report makes 21 recommendations, many of which are directed at the Law Society. I've requested the, the Access to Justice Committee review the recommendations and work with the government to develop an action plan for convocations consideration this fall. I've expanded the membership of the committee to ensure all aspects of the Law Society's policy mechanisms are considered. The committee has done some preliminary work but will be informed by submissions that are to be made up until May 15th. I've asked Mr. Goldback to keep convocation apprised. I also wanted to inform you of the conclusion of the discipline matter this week due to the nature and profile of the case. Some of you will have read about it in the media as it's been widely reported in the last couple of days. And it involved residential school survivors and their lawyer. I can tell you that the case did not unfold as expected, and I was advised that the outcome of supervisory conditions was the only viable option. I believe our experience with this particular case has exposed serious systemic issues involving the Law Society's regulatory hearing process in relation to Indigenous issues. We need to listen and learn from this so that we can do better. Going forward, I have said that the Law Society will be seeking ongoing engagement with Indigenous peoples to learn more about processes that are valued and trusted so that their expectations can be met. In the spirit of reconciliation and a commitment to do better, I have said that we will review our processes in order to accommodate Indigenous laws and Indigenous customs so that we can think and act differently to ensure that justice can be served in these type of cases in the future. The Action Committee on Civil and Family Matters, chaired by Justice Cromwell, held its annual meeting in Vancouver at the end of March. The Law Society's Access to Justice leadership was recognized with Tag Manager Sabrina Dellen speaking on a panel about the importance of public engagement in the development of meaningful access to justice solutions. Sabrina spoke about Tag's efforts to find new ways for librarians and legal professionals to work together on access to justice challenges in rural and remote communities. An impact report was prepared for the meeting and hard copies can be found outside the room on the bencher's landing. The Law Society Awards Ceremony will take place on May 24th at 4.30 p.m. in the Lamont Learning Center. The ceremony will be webcast and I'm pleased to publicly identify the recipients uh, at this time. The Law Society medalists are Patrick Case, Larry Chartron, Sarah Cohoon, Michael Izenga, Murray Hennon, Joanna Radmore and Gary B. The recipient of Lincoln Alexander Award is Thora Espinet. The Laura Legg Awards recipient is Brees Davies. The William J. Simpson Distinguished Paralegal Award goes to Dina Castro. And the J. Shirley Dennison Award it will be presented to Grace Alcada Janikas. I'm very much looking forward to meeting all of them at the ceremony. As well, I'd like to publicly announce uh, at convocation this morning the distinguished individuals who will be receiving LLDs uh, from the Law Society at the upcoming call to the bar ceremonies. Those recipients are the Honorable Mary Jo Nolan, who will receive her LLD at the June 19th call in London. Thomas Conway, who will receive his LLD at the <coughs> Ottawa call on June 23rd. The Honorable Juanita Westmoreland Traore, uh, Toronto, June 26th in the morning. Sheila Watt Cloutier, on the afternoon of June 26th. John, Dr. John Boros, June 27 in the morning, and the Honorable George Strathy, Chief Justice of Ontario, on June 27th in the afternoon. I'd like to remind you that we have our annual general meeting coming up on May the 10th at 5.15 in the Lamont Learning Center. 
One motion has been filed in accordance with the bylaw provisions and has been published in the Ontario Reports and on our website. The meeting will, of course, be webcast for anyone who wishes to observe the meeting. But members who wish to participate at the meeting must attend at Osgoode Hall in the Lamont Centre. The Federation of Ontario Law Associations May Plenary is coming up on May 10 to 12 in Ottawa. Mr. Lapper and I will be attending. There are also a number of equity events in May. I'll just address them quickly. May 9th is the Asian and South Asian Heritage Month program. This year's program will focus on the role lawyers can play in combating Islamophobia and other forms of racism and oppression at home and abroad. It begins at 5.15. On May 15th is an event called Promoting Social Harmony in Divided Times, a discourse on competing rights in which we are partnering with the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. The discussion will examine why cultural and faith practices different from our own make us uncomfortable and how we can find common ground and balance rights so as to promote understanding and reduce tensions between communities. Again, it begins at 5.15. Finally, on behalf of Convocation, I'd like to congratulate Venture Paul Copeland, who will be awarded the Diane Martin Medal for Social Justice by Osgoode Hall Law School. The award ceremony will take place on May 17, 2017 at the Osgoode Hall Law School Alumni Reception. Congratulations, Paul. With that, I will turn to the agenda. And the first item of business is the consent agenda, which is uh, moved by Michelle Hay and seconded by Diane Corbier. Is there any discussion? Questions? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Anybody on the telephone with anything they wish to say about the consent agenda? If not, I will ask for a show of hands. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Is there anybody opposed on the telephone? Hearing the silence, the motion is carried. Thank you. The conference is in lecture mode. So with that, I would call on Ms. Campbell to please address the convocation. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, Treasurer uh, Chavis, Ventures, and staff of the Law Society of Upper Canada. I'm honored to be here and would like to thank you on behalf of the Ventures of the Law Society of Manitoba. I'm very glad I had the opportunity to meet many of you um, yesterday when, when we first came in. We in Manitoba have been very fortunate to have a long and collegial relationship with our friends from the Law Society of Upper Canada. We have frequently been the beneficiaries of the expertise, skills, and resources that your Law Society has so willingly shared with us. Last week, our ventures engaged in two days of strategic planning as we look to the future. I can tell you we did so with eyes on our neighbors to the east and paid particular attention to the many impressive initiatives you've undertaken. Our ventures took a look at your random practice review program and overwhelmingly expressed support for a strategic initiative that would implement practice audits as a risk reduction initiative. Your coach and advisory network is an innovative approach to ensuring that lawyers are able to deliver services competently. <coughs> your work in access to justice through TAG and responding to the calls to action from the TRC have set a standard that every law society should aspire to. As a result of our discussions last week about the need to remove barriers to low-cost alternative service providers, the Law Society of Manitoba will, in the future, be taking a much closer <coughs> look at your model for regulating paralegals. I had the pleasure of attending the uh, reception last night for new licensees. Uh, it is clear, with your re regulation of paralegals, you have taken significant steps towards addressing the access to justice crisis that is occurring in our country. In Manitoba, we have also engaged in some initiatives of our own over the last few years, uh, the Treasurer invited me um, to share one of those with you today. In 2014, our benchers determined that we ought to explore a new governance model that would pro provide for a mix of appointed and elected lawyers and an increased number of public representatives. We approached the province and by the fall of 2015, we had legislation in place to reduce our elected benchers from 16 to 12. Those four elected benchers were replaced with four appointed lawyers. We also increased our public representatives from four to six. Of our 25 benchers, nearly 25% are now public representatives. 
We believe that to regulate in the public interest, you need significant public input. In order to fill the appointed bencher positions, we developed a matrix, both for lay benchers and for practicing lawyers, which centered a broad range of knowledge, skill sets, core competencies, perspectives, and backgrounds. We then advertised our positions, and I can tell you the response was phenomenal from both the public and from the practicing bar, who didn't want to fight on an election. As a result, almost a year ago, we had our first bencher election under the new regime. When we looked around the table and identified what was missing, we went through a process that included obviously reviewing the CVs that we received and interviewing candidates. The benchers appointed four practicing lawyers and a total of six public representatives um, to sit around the table. We now have a bencher table that looks vastly different from what it did prior to 2016. We have much greater ethnic and cultural diversity, including representation from the indigenous community. We have benchers and public representatives with a wide range of skills, knowledge, and life experience. What that has meant in practical terms is we have begun to have conversations around the bencher table that we've never had before. Thought-provoking conversations, insightful conversations that would not have existed without the change in our governance model. I now look forward to hearing the conversation around your table. And again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Campbell. We look forward to uh, um, discussing these issues with you. As you know, we have a governance task force, and uh, our governance is a little different than yours, and our size of convocation is a little different than yours. So I'm sure many people will uh, will be interested in the model that you've uh, adopted and, and your experience with it. So thank you very much for those remarks. Um, the report of the Chief Executive uh, is going to be deferred uh, to the in-camera portion of our session. So with that, I will call on Mr. Brett. And the, oh, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll, do, we'll move to audit and finance, but I'd like to begin, if you don't mind, Mr. Brett, um, with uh, Mr. Lerner, who's going to give us a brief report on the Toronto Lawyers Feed the Hungry program. Mr. Lerner. Treasurer. The last time uh, Mr. Hall and I uh, reported the convocation, I described the Lawyers Feed the Hungry uh, program as being in critical condition. I'm pleased to report the condition has been upgraded to stable, and uh, we are looking forward uh, to uh, increasing improvement. The Toronto Feed the Lawyers Hungry program. Uh, has uh, made progress since January of 2016 when Convocation approved funding of $100,000 per year for a position to support the Lawyers Feed the Hungry programs. The objective was to support programs and to assist the Toronto program in particular in becoming self-sustaining and less reliant on the Law Society for in-kind support. Uh, to refresh your memory, the Toronto Lawyers Feed the Hungry program was founded in 1998 by the late Martin Toplitsky to provide meals to those in need. The program has expanded over time from meal service once a week to four meal services on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. The program also operates in Barrie, London, Ottawa, and Windsor under different models of operation where financial support is provided to charitable agencies that help alleviate hunger, and at some locations, lawyers from those communities volunteer in serving the meals. It's easy to get caught up in the dollars and cents, but it's crucial to keep the purpose of the program in mind. That is, the Toronto program alone serves over 60,000 meals a year. Returning to the dollars and cents, the cost of operating the Toronto <coughs> program is about $400,000 annually, predominantly by direct costs. In order to make the best use of funding approved by convocation in March of 2016, a fundraising consultant was engaged to provide initial guidance and expertise in the development of a fundraising strategy to move the Toronto program in becoming self-sustaining and less reliant on the Law Society. This led to the hiring uh, of, uh, in February of this year, 
of a professional staff member with fundraising accountability and experience, development manager Aviva Malka. Uh, she will be responsible for implementing the fundraising strategy approved by the Foundation Board to create a self-sustaining model for the program, to provide guidance on fundraising efforts to the Ontario Centres, and to assume responsibility for fundraising support services previously being administered by the Law Society. So in the short term, the focus uh, will be in, on increased revenue generation and the adoption of a more effective fundraising practices to ensure that the program is on firm footing. According to the fundraising consultant, in, in conjunction with the hiring of the development manager, an increase in fundraising revenue is achievable provided a restructured fundraising committee of the foundation is established, Existing resources are maximized with a focus on the implementation of a major gift program and plan giving. The demand for meal sponsorships, uh, which raised approximately $160,000 in 2016, is maximized. And fair and sufficient time is provided for fundraising revenue to increase. It's currently envisaged that the development manager requires two years in the role for revenue to increase to a sustainable level. The fundraising consultant noted that it's most likely that the legal community will continue to be the primary funder and the core provider of crucial volunteer leadership. The current financial station of the program is healthy. Toronto Lawyers Feed the Hungry program fund balance at the end of 2016 was $935,000 with annual revenues of $755,000 up from $507,000 in 2015. Direct costs associated with operating the program have remained relatively unchanged over the last three years of approximately $400,000 per annum. The Law Society Foundation Board has been actively recruiting a chair for the new proposed fundraising committee. In addition to the Law Society Foundation's board chair, hosted a fundraising summit in April to engage prospective members of the fundraising committee and to generate new ideas for the growth, uh, growing of the Toronto uh, revenue stream. And as a sidebar, I might add that uh, at that particular summit, uh, uh, by my count, we had approximately 35 people, all of whom have been either actively involved in the program or, or who have expressed an interest in being coming involved. On a fundraising note, a bowling challenge held on April 9th and organized by Madam Justice Nancy Backhouse, Mr. Justice Mario Faeda, Jonathan Rosenthal, and a group of committed volunteers raised over $110,000 for the program. I should also mention that the 13th annual Bugsy and Ken Charity Tournament in support of the Toronto program is scheduled for June 15th. Uh, venture support of these events, whether it is in, by engaging your firms to participate, attending yourself, or getting the word out, would go a long way towards helping with the financial stability of the program. Uh, in conclusion, we are making progress in the goals of sustainability and a further reduction in law society in-kind support is achievable. However, full achievement is dependent upon the ability of the anticipated fundraising committee to open doors to donors' prospects, our ability to compete for finite dollars, uh, donor dollars, and the fundraising climate in general. For those who are not uh, aware, the committee is chaired by Ian Hall. I am the vice chair. The members are Sidney Treister, Kathy Strasberg, and Derry Miller. And our work uh, is uh, actively supported by Wendy Teisel and uh, Ms. Uh, 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 Albuquerque uh, Boutelier. Uh, and without their support, uh, our efforts uh, uh, would be far less successful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Governor. Um, are there any questions, Mr. Governor? The golf tournament's June 14th. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask. Okay. June 14th is the golf tournament. Not the 15th. And we won't ask how many strikes you got at the bowling event. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Brett, could you address the uh, communication as well? No, we'll do that later. Yeah. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. 
Um, so what we're doing here this morning is we're going to ask for your approval of the uh, Law Society's uh, annual financial statements. Um, the motion is at page 117 of board books. It's that the convocation approve the annual financial statements for the Law Society for the financial year ending December 31st, including some interfund transfers. So the first thing to note is that the uh, financial statements for this year received a clean audit opinion and uh, the report to the Audit and Finance Committee from PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, arising from their audit is provided for your information. And we have Ms. Sadia Khan here, who's with PwC in case there's any questions that people want to raise with the auditors. So if I could ask you to go to page um, 129. Of board books. Um, and if you just go to the bottom line of those schedules there, you'll see uh, basically that uh, we had a good financial year. Uh, just by way of overview, you can see um, that uh, we had a surplus of 2.6 million in the Lawyer General Fund and a surplus of 1.2 million in the Paralegal uh, General Fund. Uh, and so overall we had a combined uh, operating uh, surplus of about 3.8 million this year compared to 2.3 million last year. So how did this uh, come about? Where did we uh, do well and where do we need to pick up our socks? If I can get you to go to page 145. So what you have here and I find this is kind of helpful to understand and get a big picture of how, how we did last year. This shows you um, what our actual results were for this year, what our actual results were for last year, 2015, and how we did compared to the budget. Um, so the, the bottom line um, I'll come to is you'll see we had projected that we were going to run a deficit this year and we were going to fund that out of our general funds. Uh, instead, we've run a surplus. So uh, we have uh, added uh, to our general uh, fund uh, balance. So let's have a look just quickly um, as to where, how, where we did and how we did um, uh, on, first of all, revenues. On annual fees, you can see that our annual fees are up from last year. So we're up to 57 uh, million versus 55. Uh, that's reflecting uh, the number of new uh, people that we have called, both uh, lawyers and paralegals. And you can see that uh, we didn't do quite as well as budget. That is that we had budgeted actually for more new people and we didn't meet it, but we're doing, still doing well compared with last year. Uh, PD and C, um, you can see that uh, we're, in terms of where we're at, slightly better than last year, but significantly better than what we budgeted for. And in part, I think this is reflecting the fact that our, uh, a lot of the PD and C is being delivered online, uh, and there's been a pickup in that. Uh, and you'll see, then we come to expenses, the expenses of providing materials and programs online is significantly less. So we're getting some cost savings there too. Investment income. Um, down uh, uh, slightly from budget, but you can see that we've had a change in fair value of investment. So overall, the investments have been up and other revenues did better uh, than expected. So overall, uh, there was a positive revenue variance. When we come to expenses, um, if you look first of all at professional regulation, you can see we did better than budget there. And I think it's important to uh, keep in mind here um, that we did have a significant expense in terms of the expense, uh, the cost award uh, in the um, uh, Demerchin and uh, Sakonic matter, and that actually uh, came out of the budget. So without that, we would have done even better uh, with respect to expenses. Um, we've also uh, been able to reduce um, uh, contingent liability because our, the uncertainty surrounding some of these issues from $5 million to $1 million in terms of potential adverse cost awards. In professional development competence, you can see 
Um, again, we did better there, and I, again, I talked a bit about the reason for that, uh, the, <coughs> the cost savings that we're, we're obtaining because a lot of the programs are being provided uh, online and so forth. Corporate services did uh, better than budget. Convocation policy and outreach significantly better than budget. Uh, services to members slightly under budget. Um, and then allocations to the compensation fund. I'm going to speak a bit more about that um, because of a, a number of significant uh, cases. Um, we've had to uh, allocate a fair bit of money to the compensation fund. Um, if you go uh, back, and so just the bottom line, you can see where we're at here. Our actual result is we ran a surplus of uh, about 3.8 million versus a budgeted deficit of 2.2. Uh, so about $6 million better than budget. So that's the good news. If you go back to the uh, page 144, this is the schedule of our restricted funds. And you can see that here we're reporting a, a combined deficit of 2.7 million compared with 6.1 million in uh, 2015. And included in the restricted funds is the lawyer compensation funds, which has continued to have an adverse claims experience. Uh, the deficit for the year was 2.1 million, um, which reduced the fund balance uh, for lawyers to 12.8 million. Um, and I note that this is slightly below our fund policy balance minimum. So we have a fund policy balance that where we look at uh, uh, a one in 100 year event, and at the low end it's 13 million, at the high end it's about 48 million. What the policy says is that it, we have three years within which to bring um, the policy balances back up into the appropriate range. So when we come back with a budget, obviously one of the things that, that we'll be looking at is increasing the compensation fund levy so that the funds get back up into the approved, uh, at the approved range. Um, overall, uh, the balance sheet, which is at page 128, you don't need to turn to it. It shows total assets of 180 compared to 172. And included in the liabilities is a provision for unpaid compensation fund grants. And of course, when you look at the amount in the fund, it's net of the provisions that we've made. Um, and the provisions increased to 23 million from 19.7 million. And again, it uh, represents our estimates of the number of claims that are coming in as a result of uh, several uh, uh, events that Convocation uh, has been aware of before, primarily dealing with uh, deposits on condominium projects. Um, so uh, we're hoping that that will be addressed in future years. So uh, in summary, I think overall the financial results were good. I can say that the, the committee in our next meeting is going to be moving towards looking at our budget uh, for 2018. And I can tell you it's going to be a challenging year given the, all the new initiatives that are coming down uh, the line and uh, we will get started. So uh, before I conclude, I just wanted to thank uh, the staff uh, for their assistance throughout the year, Wendy Tysol and the uh, team of lawyers, uh, Fred. Grady, Andrew Cause, and so forth that have helped us with the uh, thing. So what you have before you is the motion. Um, uh, I'm gonna, it's moved by me, and I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Donnelly to second that. That convocation approve the audited annual financial statements for the Law Society for the financial year ending December 31st, 2016, including the interfund transfers listed in note 13 of the financial statements. And I'm open for questions. Any questions for Mr. Brett? Mr. Callahan, did I see your hand go? No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh that's yes, one. Mr. Sharda. <laughs> um, the tribunal <clears throat> have recently ordered um, legal fees to be paid. Does that show up in this, or is it showing up next year? So the um, the tribunal, the, the costs are actually awarded in the um, uh, the demergent case were included in this budget. All right, so they were paid, uh, they were awarded last year, so they, be, when they become awarded, they be, instead of being contingent, they become actual expenses. 
So if you look, when I took you through the expenses from the regulatory division, included in those expenses would have been the costs that were awarded in that matter last year. Anybody on the telephone? Mr. Lerner, can you open the line? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Is there anybody on the telephone with questions for Mr. Brett? Hearing none? Perhaps Siri has a question. <laughs> I have a question for Mr. Wardle. What do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, my question, Siri asked, is what's that again? <laughs> um, with that, I'll put it to a vote. All in favor of the room? Anybody opposed? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Is there anybody opposed to the motion on the telephone? Hearing silence, then the motion is carried. Thank you, Mr. Brett. So, and Treasurer, I'm pleased to say that not only do we save you money from time to time, we also save you time mode. from time to time. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Khan, for attending from uh, PwC as well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McGrath, law pro. Thank you, Treasurer, for this opportunity to provide an overview of Law Pro's 2016 results. The results are more fully explained in Law Pro's materials found within the Audit and Finance Committee report starting at page 220 of Board Books. As you know, our goal is to operate the company in a commercially reasonable manner while providing prudent and stable premiums to our insurers. Our record of consistent premiums, tailored cover coverage options, and expense management has resulted in another strong year. Law Pro reported net income of 8.6 million compared to 3.9 million in the budget. And comprehensive income was 15.4 million compared to a budget of 6.1 million. Shareholders' equity grew 15 million over last year to reach 253 million. The company's capital position is measured by the minimum capital test, or MCT. This calculation is used by regulators to judge an insurance company's solvency. LawPro's MCT ratio at December 31, 2016 was 253%, significantly, significantly above our recently established internal target of 170% and above the company's preferred operating range of 215 to 240%. We are in the second year of a three-year phase-in process of a new method of calculating the MCT. Without the phase-in adjustment, our MCT would still be strong at 242%. Our financial stability was bolstered by careful expense management. LawPro ended the year with an expense ratio of 2%, 8% lower than comparable insurance companies. As you know, keeping general expenses at a moderate level is a key value LawPro offers the bar. In 2016, we received 2,616 new claims. Oh, sorry, 2,616 new claims, representing 100 claims per 1,000 lawyers. This is a reasonably stable result given last year's result of 99 claims per 1,000 lawyers. Real estate and civil litigation continue to be the largest areas of law for claims. In particular, we are keeping a close <laughs> eye on any development in administrative dismissal claims resulting from lawyers not dealing effectively with the changes to Rule 48. In January 2017, which was the date the first case had to be set down <coughs> and filed or dismissed without notice under the revised rules, um, while it remains to be seen what impact the new Rule 48 will have on claims costs, we are confident that we have done the best we could to try to stem the tide. So far, results are encouraging, but it is early days 
because some registrars may not yet have issued dismissal notices. In terms of cause of loss, communication errors still lead the pack. Inadequate investigation is overtaking time management errors and failing to know and apply the law is becoming more frequent as a cause of loss. LawPro has a commitment to service and we test that commitment with the satisfaction survey. In 2016, 97% of insurers who completed the survey reported that they were satisfied with our efforts in resolving the claims. LawPro Defence Council received high approval ratings with approximately 90% of insureds stating that they would have the same council represent them again. LawPro Council succeeded in 9 out of 12 matters that went to trial and for which a decision was rendered. We, ex we succeeded in 3 out of 3 appeals argued and we won 27 out of 30 summary judgment motions completed in the year. I'd like to take this opportunity to provide a few highlights of recent and upcoming events at LawPro, beginning with access to justice initiatives. The Title Plus program, which is the only all-Canadian bar-related title insurance product, is celebrating its 20th anniversary in 2017. Its mission is to help lawyers better meet their clients' needs while supporting the role of the real estate lawyer in the transaction. In many cases, real estate practice is central to keeping lawyers' offices open in smaller communities. Keeping legal services available throughout the province is vital for access to justice outside the larger centres. LawPro is pleased to have added two initiatives to our slate of approved pro bono programs in 2016. The total now comes to 54 pro bono Ontario programs that are approved for special provisions under the law pro policy. In other efforts, we extended the protection of runoff coverage for lawyers on exemption who are acting as mentors. Mentoring promotes the dissemination of knowledge from experienced <coughs> lawyers to those with less experience. Law pro recognizes that lawyers are sometimes the best resource for each other. Law pro's success to date has allowed us to plan for a measured reduction in revenues to reflect the company's current capital position and investment environment. This process led to the reduction in base premium for the 2017 insurance program. Through the program or through the premium reduction, we are purposely giving value back to the primary program insurance. Overall, 2016 was a successful year where law pro remains strong with steady financial results and managed our business to provide commercial, commercially reasonable coverage for our insureds at an affordable rate. Next week, the board will start the planning process for the 2018 program, and at the end of that process, we will see whether our assumptions are still valid and what impact they will have on our future revenue needs. The full Law Pro Annual Report is available at page 38 of Board Books, and online at lawpro.ca if you would like a more detailed review. I also encourage you to watch for a special year in review edition of Law Pro magazine, which will delve into how the company met its mandate in 2016. That issue should be in your inbox in the next few weeks. Thank you for your attention, and I, or Ms. Waters, with your permission, Treasurer, will be happy to respond to your questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. McGrath and Ms. Waters? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. It's retirement group again. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments on the telephone? Hearing nothing, then uh, thank you very much for that report, and thank you, Ms. Waters and Mr. Jorgensen, for coming. Thank you. The conference is in lecture mode. <coughs> That and we'll move to the Paralegal Standing Committee, Ms. Hay. Thank you, Treasurer. So we are at tab 3.1, page 374 of board books. The Paralegal Standing Committee has one item for decision today regarding the amendments to rules regarding conflicts of interest. The motion is that convocation approve the amendments to the Paralegal Rules of Conduct that are set out at tab 3.1.1 which is also at page 375 of board books. 
These amendments co correspond to amendments to lawyers' rules and convocation approved in February of 2016. The changes arise from the work of the Federation of Law Societies on the Model Code of Professional Conduct, which has led to a review of a number of provisions of the rules governing both lawyers and paralegals. Convocation has approved the principle that rules for lawyers and paralegals should be consistent where possible. The proposed wording for the rule of, on conflicts of interest is shown at page 376. The redraft is intended to enhance guidance to paralegals on obtaining consent from a client where there is a conflict of interest by eliminating the distinction between express and implied consent. The motion is moved by myself and is seconded by Ms. Krieger. And that's all Are there any questions or comments? Ms. Hay, in the room? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Are there any questions for Ms. Hayes? Thank you. Mr. Captain Frostberg, I'm on. I just didn't get a chance to tell you I'm here. Thank you, Ms. Frostberg. Um, then okay. The conference is not lecture mode. We don't want to don't want to be uh, engaged in wiretapping. Or <laughs> um, all in favor? Is there anyone opposed in the room? Anybody opposed on the telephone? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. <laughs> the motion is carried. Thank, Thank you. you. I tried just to note that uh, convocation will see that there's a second item on our agenda which um, is being deferred to next month, I believe. That's related to the communicating with the Thank you. Okay. The conference is in lecture mode. And Mr. McDowell, I think it's the same thing as being deferred. That's right. Uh, uh, several members of uh, convocation have raised issues that I think warrant some further discussion. Thank you. So we refer the matter of the uh, rules regarding communicating with witnesses, and we will turn to the advertising and fee issues. Mr. Mercer. So I expect this will be short as well. Le son et lumière. This is the third report of the working group to convocation. You'll recall that last uh, February, now two months ago, we presented our second report, and at that time convocation adopted amendments to the advertising rules, including the commentary, and convocation uh, determined as a policy matter uh, not to prohibit or ban referral fees, but rather to cap them and regulate them so as to ensure transparency and consent. The purpose of this report uh, is to uh, give flesh to the policy determination made by convocation in February. The working group has further areas that it continues to work on. Uh, they are contingent fees generally, and those who have been following the uh, the press, the Marshall Report, the private members bill in the Ontario Legislature will know that contingent fees are a matter of significant public interest and uh, we have yet to come with a report in respect of that, not because it's unimportant but because we're doing this in an orderly way and I want to be clear that we'll be coming back with recommendations in that respect. We are also dealing with uh, the issue of advertising in the real estate area and fixed price advertising and related issues and I'm not presenting today with respect to that. I want to highlight, as I did in February, the role of convocation today and you are aware that, because we've reported this, the Professional Regulation Division uh, continues to work diligently on investigating a number of matters in this area and that is treated as a priority matter. However, uh, that's not our job here. Our job here is not to interfere with that side of the Law Society. Our job is to, as a policy matter, uh, set conduct rules and deal with bylaws, not in respect of individual cases, uh, but rather to deal with the policy issues. 
So I just want everybody to be clear, don't mess it up. <laughs> the report is at uh, page 419 of board books, and you'll see in paragraph 22 the specific motions which uh, I make in Ms. Horvat seconds. They are to approve the cap and regulate approach for referral fees that's generally described in paragraph 25 of the report, to approve certain amendments uh, as set out at the tabs 4.2.1 and 0 .3 uh, to the lawyer's conduct rules, similarly to approve amendments in the paralegal uh, conduct rules, and to request paralegal standing to amend the guidelines. Not everyone will be aware that the guidelines for the paralegal rules are a matter within the jurisdiction of paralegal standing. And finally, an amendment to the bylaws. What I want to do is describe generally, uh, at a fairly high level, the elements of this proposal without getting necessarily into the details of the, the specific rules and bylaws. The first is a cap, and in se reaching a recommendation for a cap, your working group uh, worked hard to come to a consensus position that we could all support. And what we have before you is our unanimous recommendation, which has been approved by the committees through which we report. I, I hasten to say that this isn't the right cap. There is no right cap. There will be a number of different caps that different people could think uh, are better uh, the trick is to find one which is reasonable. What we've done, we think, is to, to reach a proposal which is sound and within the range of reasonableness. I, I make this point because I know that we all like to look at things and think that there is a, perhaps a slightly better way of doing it, and you could have a long debate about that. What we've tried to do really is achieve two objectives. The first is not to set a cap that would be equivalent to a ban, Convocation decided in February not to ban, but to cap. The second thing we did was try to set effectively a cap which restored practice back to the prior market levels where referral fees were in the 10 to 15 percent range as opposed to what seems now to be the case 20, 25, 30, 35 percent. Our principal goal was to get back to levels which at the time seemed not to be problematic, there being no perfect answer as to what the right level was. But in fact, we've taken it slightly back from historic levels uh, nonetheless. What we've proposed is a staged cap, a sliding cap, uh, with an absolute limit. For smaller cases, for cases where the lawyer doing the work or the paralegal doing the work earns up to $50,000, we would have a 15% cap. That represents, as we look at the last closed auto study, probably slightly in excess of two-thirds two of claims. Slightly more than that, in fact, but in that range. For, uh, let me tease that out. A lawyer, if you assume or paralegally, if you assume a one-third contingency, a 33% contingency, would earn $50,000 on a claim of $150,000 recovered. So that's order of magnitude, the common claim, but the smaller claim. So for those smaller claims, nonetheless significant, 15% is the proposed maximum. As you get above that amount, as the lawyer or paralegal earns more than $50,000 who is doing the work, the amount that they can pay as a referral fee drops down on that difference to 5%. And when the total amount reaches $25,000, there can be no higher referral fee than that. And that works out to approximately a million dollar uh, recovered claim. So bottom line, we're less than where we were historically and significantly less than some of the aberrant amounts in the market now. We've dropped down below 10 to 15 percent. We're allowing some greater amounts for smaller cases 
and lesser amounts for larger cases, and there is a limit in the total. <coughs> As I said, not perfect. One can argue uh, whether or not the exact numbers are right, but that's the approach that we propose. Now, in my view, just as important is the other side of the proposal, which is the regulate to ensure consent and transparency. And you'll see, if you've looked at the report, that there are several elements to that which are intended to make sure that clients know what's going on, that clients decide whether or not what's going on is acceptable to them, that clients decide who their lawyer or paralegal will be, and that clients have the basis to make their decisions. We propose a mandatory referral agreement, which is set out at tab 4.2.9. <clears throat> that requires that the fact of any relationship between the referrer and the referee be disclosed. It requires that reasons be given for the referral. It requires that more than one name be given, unless it's not reasonably possible to do so. It requires that the client be given the Law Society's disclosure on requirements for referral fees, and you'll see that disclosure at tab 4.2.10. It requires that the client be advised and confirm their understanding that they have no obligation to retain the lawyer or paralegal to whom they've been referred, and that they have the right to terminate their retainer at any time for any reason without this being a breach of this agreement, and that they have no obligation to the referrer or to the referee by virtue of the referral agreement. The intent is that the client have rights and have disclosure, but not have obligations as a result. I won't take you further into it, but my recommendation to you that it is probably more important than the cap that the client be in control and be properly informed, but the cap, of course, is important. We also recommend that there be record-keeping and reporting obligations. We recommend that, and there is an amendment proposed for the bylaws, that lawyers paying referral fees and receiving referral fees be obliged to keep accounting records of those. This is both uh, an accountability mechanism, but it's also a practical way of ensuring compliance. If, if people know that they have to keep accounts, and if they know their counterparty have to keep accounts, then they're more likely to be accurate in the way uh, they conduct their affairs. And if the Law Society on audit or practice review or otherwise has access to this information. It's a way of looking, uh, ensuring transparency into those arrangements. We also propose that there be annual reporting of the total quantum of referral fees paid and referral fees received. Again, uh, this is in aid of sunlight. Uh, if licensees know that attention is being paid in an area, they're more likely to be careful but as well it allows us to know, similarly to other uh, areas where we do the same, uh, condominium actually is an example that comes to mind today. We require in the newest annual report reporting as to whether or not you do condominium work. That's because that says that you're an area, an area where you, we may wish to have regulatory scrutiny given the risks there. This provides a similar access uh, mechanism so we know who is active in this area. And as well, frankly, it allows us, if we see uh, activity in the marketplace, whether it be on buses or otherwise, that suggests there must be referral fees, and yet they are not being reported, it allows us to look and see what uh, is up. Two other advantages. One is if the total paid and the total received in the annual reports doesn't add up in total, then we do <coughs> something rather useful. And finally, uh, it is at least arguable that as public interest regulators, we often make decisions without enough hard data. 
And this is an area where further hard data going forward may be useful. Many have said that we should be concerned about compliance with these recommendations, and we are very concerned. There is what I describe as an anti-gaming rule in the proposals, which is that you can't do indirectly what you can't do directly. And we've given some examples in the commentary how to think about that. We've adopted some language uh, in the commentary from the Income Tax Act around uh, avoidance and evasion. And in the report, you'll note, although we've not put it in the commentary, that licensees should understand if they breach rules in a way which is dishonest, fraudulent, uh, or demonstrates ungovernability, uh, that they put themselves at substantial risk to their license. We haven't put that in the rules, haven't put that in the commentary, uh, but the working group wishes uh, all to understand that we should be serious about this. We propose that upfront referral fees should be prohibited, and I've described previously why we make that proposal. We are concerned about aligning interests, not uh, shopping for the best price at the outset. Uh, we continue the proposal that referrals where there's a conflict of interest shouldn't attract a fee, and we recommend that lawyers or paralegals who are suspended and therefore make a referral shouldn't be entitled to recover for that uh, in that disciplinary context. Finally, uh, I would note the transition approach that we take. Uh, we recognize that uh, established and forcible legal agreement should not be disturbed uh, retrospectively, and so we acknowledge that the change rules do not apply uh, to enforceable agreements in place as of today. We, however, recommend if you can't show that you've got a written agreement uh, that you'd be obliged to notify your client that this arrangement exists so that there's a record of it promptly. I think that's the end of what I want to describe. I can describe the details if you wish uh, further in response to questions. I do want to, uh, to recognize on your behalf the staff assistance in this area, which has been significant over long periods of time. Uh, Judith Straczynski, Naomi Busson, and Margaret Drent uh, have assisted you greatly. Thank you very much, Mr. Mercer. Yes, Mr. Uh, Thank you, Treasurer. Can you speak, please? Yes, oh, you, you can speak right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Treasurer. Mm -hmm. uh, through you to Mr. Mercer, I appreciate all the work that he and his committee have, have done on this. Uh, I would, however, unless I missed it, I would have liked to see reference to what other professions have done with regards to uh, referral fees. For example, I uh, was at the dentist yesterday, and for those of us who uh, do not have insurance coverage, when the dentist refers you to a specialist, we know that the specialist fees are, are very expensive. Um, I'm happy with my dentist, I'm happy with the specialist they've been referred to, I've been happy with their fees. If I have any concerns, I discuss it with them. But the point I'd like to stress is that I'm not asked to sign a mandatory referral agreement. I think that's unnecessary. With regards to today's proposals, I can understand very well the necessity for a cap, for a fair and reasonable cap. I have no quarrel with that at all. However, what I, I do take issue with is the what's proposed for the implementation of this cap, and in particular the mandatory <coughs> referral fee agreement. Um, in my humble submission, I believe that while the proposal may be well intended, I think it's going to be counterproductive. I understand the need for transparency, but I, I still feel that it will be counterproductive because many lawyers who should prefer a matter on because they do not have the expertise are simply not going to go through all the rigmarole, if I want to, if I can phrase it that way, of, to 
uh, go through a mandatory referral agreement which has to be signed by the client, by the referring lawyer, and the lawyer that the matter has been referred to. I think disclosure should be made to the client, and that could easily be done by the lawyer that the matter is referred to. I have no objection to the referral fee being referred to in a statement of account, but I do think that the mandatory referral agreement is going to be counterproductive, and uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Callahan. I uh, wasn't here the last time uh, that I saw it was a poll vote. Um, I, I wouldn't have voted to allow uh, referral fees. Uh, clients are chattel to be sold. Uh, but having lost that vote, and my vote wouldn't have made a difference to the outcome, I, I can see the merit of the proposal, and I uh, applaud the committee. I think that the cap arrangement works. My concern is with the reporting of income, uh, which I think is a precedent in which we ought not to go. Uh, I don't know of us ever having asked any sector of our membership to do that. Uh, it is the ultimate in privacy and respect of a person's livelihood. It is not a matter of disinfectant sunshine, uh, necessarily, because it could be disinfectant sunshine to ask all of us to report not only our, our incomes, but our hours to determine whether our fees are deemed reasonable, which would meet one of our criteria. I think it's a very, very dangerous and frankly as presented unprincipled approach if you want to talk policy and say what policy it issues, I don't know how we're going to understand what referral fees mean unless we know the gamut of what contingency fees are, what percentage, so we might as well ask the contingency lawyers to produce their income. While we're at it, since this is driven by the insurance industry, why don't we look at what all personal injury lawyers are making and all those in the insurance industry so we can see whether the plaintiff's bar is a proportionate to the defense bar. The argument goes on and on. But it is a very unprincipled thing, as far as I'm concerned, to ask a sector of our bar, or of our membership, to report their income, and only one sector. So I personally would have said they can't be there. I personally would have said, end referral fees. Clients are not chattels. People walking into, uh, into a all law offices are not chattels to be sold. But having gone down that route, uh, the wisdom of convocation, don't double down and make the mistake of accepting that certain sectors of the profession need to report their income because you will be next. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Mr. Brett. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Treasurer. So as, as usual, uh, I agree sometimes with Mr. Callahan, and I d don't agree with him sometimes. So... I don't know if you agree with me sometimes. <laughs> So I, I like I like uh, Mr. Callahan um, was not able to be here in February. I was reading to kids in Ghana, which was very rewarding, and I missed the debate. But I um, I would not have supported the initiative either. Um, I I'm of the view that lawyers have an obligation to refer matters out if they don't have the expertise, and that they should not be charging for that because that's what we are all this lawyer should be doing. Um, that, that debate has been lost, and I agree with Mr. Callahan <coughs> on that. That being said, um, I do strongly support the approach um, on transparency uh, that the committee has taken. It seems to me um, that uh, a lot of 
the business practices that we all find distasteful as lawyers and as benchers are driven by lack of transparency and accountability. And I wholeheartedly support that approach, the fact that it has to be out in the open, because we are here to regulate in the public interest. And I have to say that I don't believe the public has been very well served by the approach that has been taken in this area previously. So um, unlike Mr. Callahan, I think what is being proposed is reasonable. It's clearly in the public interest, and I support it wholeheartedly. The question that I have for Mr. Mercer really relates to the CAF. Um, and I guess, for, in principle, I would say that you could support a referral fee on the basis that the lawyer is putting in some work to examine the case and to figure out what's about and, and then to refer it on. Um, but it seems to me, and this issue will play as well when you come to contingency fees, is that there's no automatic assumption that because you've got a $2 million case, it requires $25,000 worth of work versus a much smaller case where you're going to get $2,500. And I can understand there may be some practical uh, approach, but I'm, I'd be helpful if you could just give us a bit of the the committee's reasoning as to the why it was seemed to make sense that a referral fee should go for more significantly for a larger case, even though it might involve the same amount of time and effort uh, amongst the lawyer who's referring it. Because I, as I said, in principle, if, if the lawyer is taking some time to meet with the client, understand what the case is, and to figure out who the appropriate person is, I can justify a referral fee on that basis, but it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, change based upon the scale of the case. So that, that's my question for uh, Mr. Mercer, but overall I'd say that I think this is a very sensible approach to this issue, and I do believe it's in the public interest. Thank you, Mr. Brett. Uh, Mr. Mercer, do you want to respond to that specific question at this point? on the specific question of why a percentage. Mr. Brett's question, the underlying premise of his question is that there shouldn't be referral fees, but rather there simply should be uh, an amount paid based on the amount of work done for the referral. And that's certainly a legitimate uh, perspective, but the effect of that perspective is that you should be only charging for work that you do. <coughs> that wasn't the position that was supported ultimately in convocation. While it may be that, uh, well, I accept that Mr. Brett would have voted the other way, the, the point of this is that we are dealing with a market phenomenon uh, where uh, people attract work <coughs> and the value of what is being referred and the value of what is being received uh, is tied uh, to the amount of the fee <coughs> being paid. Uh, one can s agree with that being legitimate or not. The mischief that we've sought to address is the increase in the amount being paid because we are concerned that the amount being paid uh, is pushing up the cost to the ultimate client by pushing up contingent fee rates or alternatively is causing the work to be done to be diminished because the lawyer or paralegal doing the work isn't being paid as much for the work that is to be done. So my difficulty in answering Mr. Brett's question in a way that would satisfy him is that I think his premise is that we've gone down the wrong route. Uh, I can't justify it on the basis that he asks because it's not justified on that basis, in fact. Should have fallen in from Gavin, Mr. Brett. <laughs> Mr. Cooper. Just want to add quickly uh, for everybody's consideration uh, before they vote, I'd like to review three things, which is chattels, transparency, and referrals. First with chattels. Uh, I do not see this as chattels, just like I would imagine anyone in a large firm who was a rainmaker when they sent the client out to other lawyers to do work in their firm, that they were not trading in chattels. Small practitioners and practitioners outside of Toronto do not have necessarily the same type of firms. They do have clients, and they have client loyalty, and they have client management. And as part of that, they, if they refer someone out, they can choose to have a fee or not. And they will still 
in my experience, communicate with the client and ensure that who they refer them to, that they are happy with them and they understand the process. So that's important. Transparency. There's an agreement. That agreement is only for if there's going to be a referral fee. If you're referring, as many have, such as I, traditionally to others for no fee, that's a choice I make. But I don't have to get into that. Transparency in reporting and ensuring that people are complying with the rules. If you want a referral fee and you're following the rules, then as part of our monitoring for the public interest, that's a necessary part of it. And lastly, again, with respect to referral fees, there is a purpose to it. We voted a convocation. We've come back with a very reasonable path. Um, if you look at a $50,000 actual award and a, for example, a fee of ten dollars to $15,000, referral on that, the referral fee is between $500 and $800. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Mr. McDowell. many years ago and applied to Mr. Callahan, I enjoy him when he's witty, but not when he's half witty. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but I was hectored from the corner. <laughs> Just a, several brief points. One is that Mr. Callahan is onto something in speaking about uh, chattels, because where this discussion began was in the specter of cases where literally we had members of the bar saying, if you want to speak to this badly injured person and his family in the next room, you will do a number of things, including giving me $50,000 up front. And all of this lack transparency and uh, the referral and the reasons for the referral were often not clear. So that's where this comes from. But I think that the uh, answer to that and what makes it not demeaning to the dignity of these vulnerable, injured people uh, is largely the transparency uh, that these rules uh, would require. And so, you know, where the client knows here is the reason for the referral, i.e. it's not within the expertise, here is the relationship, including the prior relationship, uh, here is the arrangement, and we've got mandatory language so that there's no backsliding on the disclosure of what the arrangement is. I think that should address uh, Mr. Callahan's concern about the uh, chattels because you then have an informed client making the decision as to whether or not this arrangement uh, makes sense or not. Um, but to come then to the question of disclosure on an annual basis of the amount of the referral fees, I mean, I struggle with this as well, uh, but the Law Society already gets all sorts of information that's a bit intrusive. I mean, at some level, why is it anybody's business uh, whether I'm practicing family law and in what percentage? Um, so another way to do this might be to say, looking at your practice in terms of uh, income, how much of your income as a percentage declared in the annual form comes from referral fees? But I think that's actually more intrusive. And I think that what's being disclosed now, i.e. how much of your, of your income comes from, in, in what number, comes from referral fees, uh, is not disclosing income. Because we're not asking what percentage is it of your, your whole practice. So, yes, is it more intrusive uh, uh, to do that than to leave things as they are? Uh, admittedly it is. But this is an area in which there's been considerable abuse where I think we need to have the information to know whether to, where to devote our auditing and other resources, and for that reason, uh, I support the measure and indeed the, the proposal generally. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. McDowell. Mr. Bird.
Basically, uh, I have a question for Mr. McDowell and the working group, and it goes along with Mr. Brett's comments, and that, and that is, is when we were capping these referral fees, was there any other consideration other than to be directly linked to the award uh, of the uh, contingency fee? Is there any other method? And I agree with Mr. Brett, if I am simply referring a matter, whether it's for a $50,000 claim or a $100,000 claim, isn't it just the principle that I've referred that matter out? And why should I be rewarded a greater amount? And why should it be directly linked to the outcome of that claim? So I'm asking if the working group considered any other alternatives so that the public was satisfied that we are doing this in their best interest and that it's not directly linked to how much money is rewarded, but rather than that the service that was being offered by the referring paralegal or lawyer. And that would be my question. Again, it's difficult to, to know exactly what to say. If I remind you of the process, we started this exercise maybe 16 or 17 months ago, we went out and we, through uh, <coughs> the assistance of Mr. Kasky, a former venture, went out to people who are participants in various parts of the professions. Uh, we put out a consultation in June of last year, uh, <coughs> nine or so responses. Uh, we then met as a working group and considered all of that. There has never been a suggestion <coughs> that if you do work <coughs> with someone that is time spent and is worthy of being charged as time spent, that you can't earn a fee for doing that work. So if you do <coughs> sit down and spend three hours or four hours working up a referral, uh, charging the client for that assistance is not affected by this proposal. What this proposal does is deal with the amount paid by the lawyer or paralegal to whom the work is referred. While one can imagine other sorts of caps, uh, we didn't investigate uh, in any serious way uh, other alternative types of caps because that's not what's in the marketplace and not the phenomenon that we were dealing with. As Mr. McDowell rightly says, we were addressing a particular type of mischief and trying to get back to a situation in terms of the amounts that was thought not unreasonable. So this is one of those situations where the best I can say is we try to regulate as I think we should, taking into account the way the world is actually working. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lerner. First question I pose is to uh, Mr. Brett and Mr. Callahan, on behalf of Mr. Braithwaite and Ms. McLean and myself, where were you when we needed you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, okay. It's kind of ironic that several of the issues on the agenda today, uh, or that are under consideration, one being advertising, one being contingency fees, uh, and one being referral fees, there will be some people in this room who approved those uh, three different concepts at some time while they were sitting around this table. And I can only imagine that none of them contemplated when they initially passed referral fees, for instance, which was clearly in the public interest and was the motivation behind doing so, never expected that we'd be dealing with this issue today. And it's, it's somewhat disconcerting to know that we are dealing with these issues again today only because some members of this profession have abused something that was adopted and intended for the public interest. That's why we're back here talking about referral fees again. That's why we're dealing with advertising, and that's why we're dealing with contingency fees. And to some extent, it's somewhat of a sad commentary upon us. But dealing specifically with referral fees, um, I, I must say, within the working group, uh, it was a balancing act. And 
no one quite knew where exactly the point of equilibrium would be. So that it encouraged people to refer uh, files to somebody who was more experienced, better qualified to do the work, rather than retain it themselves and, uh, and do any number of things that would be contrary to the client's interest. And a fee that the client would clearly understand was intended in its his or her best interest to be passed on. And at the same time, restrict the amount that was being paid uh, uh, in consideration of uh, the actual referral. I think Mr. Mercer uh, hit the nail right on the head when he said, uh, this, was a, this was a very interesting dialogue because in trying to determine percentages and amounts, we tried to look back and preserve the original intention when these referral fees were first adopted uh, by the Law Society some years ago. So whether we're right or we're wrong, uh, maybe it's going to take another 20 or 25 years to determine. Uh, but none of this was cast in stone, and there was certainly not unanimity during the course of the discussion. But those of us on the working group who thought there ought not to be referral fees were satisfied that this is a reasonable compromise. And those of, who were the, the, the vocal proponents of referral fees similarly thought that this was reasonable. And I think that's the only way we can explain or justify it to anybody who might ask, we believe we've done the reasonable thing. Mr. Ennett. <laughs> Thank you, Treasurer. Um, <clears throat> uh, like Mr. Callahan and Mr. Brett, um, I strongly opposed referral fees in principle. Unlike Mr. Callahan and Mr. Brett, I attended convocation. <laughs> <laughs> and cast a losing, losing vote. My question to Mr. Mercer is about, uh, that having been done, uh, my question to Mr. Mercer is about transition. Um, as I understand it, th th there is a section on transition in the uh, report, but it, it deals with referral fee arrangements centered into before today versus today and after today. Um, and uh, my uh, sense is that this is a fairly elaborate mechanism that's been put in place, and I wonder whether it's appropriate to put a lawyer who doesn't, or paralegal who doesn't implement this new referral um, system today or tomorrow in breach of the rules. Um, and I simply ask, should there be some efforts in the area, by the Law Society, in the area of communication and education before the effective date? It's a completely legitimate point. The, I think the answer to it is that there are uh, devils on both sides of that proposition. Uh, one of the concerns that we had was that one could have, for those who are prepared to be malignant in their approach, giving time to, uh, before the effective date, allows uh, gaming to be done, which uh, is a concern. I think Mr. Anand is entirely right that you could have people who, in an innocent way, don't realize that they're afoul of the rules. Uh, as they're put in place today. The answer to that, it seems to me, uh, is threefold. One is communication, and there will be communication coming out of uh, uh, today. Uh, the second is that those for whom referral fees are any material thing, I bet you are watching really carefully. And the third is our uh, professional regulation division uh, is thoughtful in their way of dealing with uh, rule breach where it's innocent and inadvertent. So I think we could either try to deal with it in a, in a way which creates risk on one side or the other. My, my personal view, and we haven't spent much time about it on the, on the mechanism, uh, is that Mr. Anand is right to identify the concern, but I think it uh, can be practically dealt with as opposed to a different day. 
Ms. Ross? I too would have voted against referral fees. Uh, alas, while I was at convocation, I don't have a vote. Uh, and I say that coming from the perspective of having been the member of the Rules Task Force in 2000 when referral fees were first introduced uh, to the, the legal profession. Uh, and the ta none of the other task force members are here today. Gavin McKenzie, Derry Miller, Mr. Justice John Laskin, Paul Perrell, but I do see my friend Jim Barrow, who was our policy advisor. The intention, and I don't, I'm not trying to re-argue uh, what was decided at convocation in February, but just by way of a little bit of historical background, the honest intention was to encourage lawyers uh, who are not competent to do a matter to refer the matter away. And the rule as it currently stands, and it's pretty much unchanged from the rule that we presented to Convocation and Convocation approved in 2000, provides for significant disclosure and transparency. Uh, and I won't read it to you, but I commend it to you to simply look it up. First of all, there has to be full disclosure about the referral fee, the amount. The client must consent in writing and the referral fee must not increase the overall proper fee charged to the client between the two lawyers, the referring lawyer and the referred to lawyer law firm. Clearly, <coughs> what we neophytes in our honest intention from a policy perspective hoped would happen did not, and in fact this has been a source of significant abuse. We've heard much of it, uh, over the course of this matter being reviewed and brought to convocation. My concern is, notwithstanding the additional provisions that have been introduced here today in the hopes of creating transparency and accountability, we learned in law school there is no law if it is unenforceable. And my concern is, notwithstanding the, the former rule, which provided for considerable disclosure in writing, what is to guarantee that this new set of provisions is going to provide the kind of accountability, transparency, and ability for the law society, the regulator, to truly monitor and audit uh, these arrangements. Ms. Sleeper. Thank you, Treasurer. Members of Convocation. I'm carrying two briefs here simultaneously. Uh, Mr. Sikand has asked me to raise the point on his behalf that any agreement entered into between the client and the lawyer referring should make it very clear what the client is agreeing to. And he had some concerns about small print and um, carrying that forward. So that's brief number one. Uh, brief number two on my own behalf, I was present and voted against referral fees. And I wanted to start by respecting and stating my respect for the work done by the committee on this very difficult set of questions and to say why I will be voting against it today, again with respect to my colleagues. I see this referral fee as destructive. Uh, it's anti-competitive in my view. It's a corrupting business policy and I feel as though by voting for a way to manage it, I'm settling for a little bit of corruption. So uh, I can't vote for it for that reason, and I wanted to uh, say that. Thank you. So no cap. <laughs> Thank you, Treasurer. Uh, I don't propose to relitigate the vote that's already taken place. What occurs to me is that, as is so often the case with the work that we do, uh, there is a balancing act to be done. I respect the balance we've achieved. I don't think that there is a, a right and a wrong. Here's my difficulty. My difficulty is not with the proposal that we've made, is that there is very little discussion, very little discussion, about communication with the public about what we've done. And by that, I'm not talking about the direct uh, accountability to the client per se, but why uh, and how this is intended to operate. My experience, <coughs> excuse me, with uh, 
our failings as a law society is exactly in this area, our inability to communicate our good work to the public. This is a very obviously uh, difficult issue. Words like chattels, etc., with all due respect to my colleague, don't advance the issues. This is a question of monetization of legal services. It happens every day. Why we're doing this has to be communicated to the public. And I worry in a very concrete way that this is again where we're going to fail. So I raise it now because I say it's not going to be in our rule amendments where we fall. It's going to be in our inability to communicate to the broader public how we're operating in the public interest. I, for one, want to indicate that I happen to practice an area that, that, uh, it, that many don't uh, ascribe to, police accountability work. There are very few people, very few members of the profession, who actually practice in an area in which your return, your ability to deliver for a client in uh, a case where sadly a member of the public has died at the hands of the police is dependent, dependent on a contingency arrangement. And it is hoped that lawyers out there who don't practice in this area won't dabble. So this actually addresses that in a real way. What I want to emphasize is if there is not education of the people who are actually being protected by these kinds of arrangements, then we fail. So again, I repeat, I think there are good things here, but if we don't explain ourselves, we talk about transparency, but frankly, transparency is actually about people understanding what you're doing. I'm not at all convinced we've uh, conquered that particular hill, and that's what I think we have to direct our attention to once the mechanics are finished. Thank you, Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Faulkner. I would note that you're the chair of the communications steering group. So. <laughs> <laughs> While it's not a broad communication, I do direct convocation's attention to uh, requirements for referral fees, what clients need to know, tab 4.2.10, which is required to be given to individual clients. That's the individual. That's the problem. Oh, of Thank you. Uh, point taken, Mr. Faulkner. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Mr. Wright? Thank you, Treasurer. Mr. Lerner will be interested to know that at the time there were benchers who argued against it and predicted the very harms that have now manifested. Um, I think it's outrageous that you can get upwards of $25,000 for following the rules of professional conduct and referring out work that you're not competent to do. I think the mischief of referral fees is that they're too lucrative and people can make a living just doing referrals. So to address Ms. Ross's point about um, monitoring and enforcement and so on, if we make it non-lucrative to do the referrals, then the problem essentially goes away. I think the problem with this proposal is that the cap is way too high, the percentage amount is way too high, and it should go back to the task force or committee working group, should go back to the working group to rethink the cap and the percentages that are in this proposal. Thanks. <clears throat> Mr. Sharp? Two points. Uh, it seems to me we're responding to a particular aspect of our services in that we're responding to personal injury predominantly from the values that we are showing. Because I don't know of any other area where we have such significant uh, amounts of referrals. Um, I don't think I can support the, uh, probably on the losing side of it, which is fine. Um, I don't think I can support the proposed rule change because I, I agree with Mr. Callahan that I don't think it's our business to be uh, asking for how much of your fees come from the money. Either you don't make referrals or you do your work and you earn, it, earn the money appropriately. But that having said, I'm concerned about communication in ethnic communities because I often hear paralegals uh, on the ethnic radios, on the ethnic newspapers and TV shows who are re receiving, like they're out there being the people who fill out the forms and then handing off files to lawyers and they often say in their own respective languages, we have a team of lawyers who will do this case for you, etc. And I'm concerned about whether the communication will be done to the appropriate 
ethnic communities uh, because that's where you're going to have uh, a lot of people who do not understand your rules and do not understand that uh, there should be an issue on referrals. Uh, they, they see, they find a person who can speak English, they think that's confident, that's good enough, but they may not understand all this other stuff that you're trying to achieve. So I don't know if you'll achieve that in those respective communities, so that's where I have concern. But uh, anyway, that being said, I will exercise my right to vote. Thank you, Mr. Sharda, and, and point on communications is well taken, and staff are here, and uh, we will, uh, I'm sure, be looking at all those issues as, as we are, in fact, the, the <coughs> as well, so thank you for those remarks. Um, we're going to go to the, uh, one more, Mr. Ferry. I just, uh, briefly, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I was not here uh, as well, and I would have voted against uh, continuation of uh, referral fees. I wanted to state that for the record, but since convocation has rather overwhelmingly approved continuation of referral fees, I think what has been proposed by the committee is a fair and reasonable solution. Thank you very much. Um, we'll then go to the phone, Mr. Lerner. The uh... conference is no longer in lecture mode. Is there anybody on the phone who wishes to address convocation on this issue? I do. It's Har Harvey Strasberg. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Strasberg. Um, Treasurer, thank you. The report focuses on the personal injury areas, primarily in the motor vehicle accident. accidents. There is no provision for the $25,000 to be increased by the cost of li living, <coughs> like $100,000 limit for general damages in the trilogy. So I think that should be added. In this committee report, there is no mention. David, sir, are you ready for prayer? Sorry, can you please press star six on the telephone if they're not addressing the application? Sounds good. Because we're hearing some noise. I'm sorry. Can I continue? Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Strasburg. It's just we're hearing some other people on the telephone that are interrupting you. Um, I'm sorry. I understand. The young boys interrupt me. <laughs> Please proceed, Mr. Strasburg. In the committee report, there is no mention about class actions. And the concept of referrals in the class action context in class actions, the firms involved routinely deal with referral fees from other lawyers and or from other provinces and or from other countries. Uh, I suggest that class actions should be excluded from this report and until the committee addresses this issue fully, in class actions, class counsel reports to the court and the fee is set by the court and all information has, has to be uh, given to the court. It is not in the public interest to set a system in advance unless the committee hears from the class action bar and from the, the judiciary and the public. I offer uh, friendly amendments to <coughs> accept class actions until the committee has uh, uh, studied class actions and to that the $25,000 should be increased by the cost of living. That's my suggestion. Suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strasburg. Um, is there anybody else on the telephone who wishes to address convocation? 
Hearing nobody, then I'll ask Mr. Mercer uh, to uh, respond. Um, I, I suppose I should ask the, uh, at the outset with respect to Mr. Strasburg, is that a friendly amendment? Uh, yes. <laughs> we, I, we know you described it that way, Mr. Strasburg. <laughs> so I, I don't think I can accept it as a friendly amendment given the work of the working group. It, I think it would be outside of the, the process that we've undertaken for me to, to make that assumption. Uh, we can certainly uh, consider uh, whether or not we should do anything else at our next working group meeting, but I don't propose to accept it as a friendly amendment. What I should say... Well, is what I should say, though, is that we have uh, input uh, that we've asked for through a consultation process, and ironically, the current rules prohibit referral fees paid to lawyers in other provinces and other countries. Uh, and so if that's actually a, a process or a practice that we're supposed to not be getting in the way of, it's currently contrary to the rules, it may be that we should open that up. Uh, that's arguable, but that's not part of our report. As to the CPI adjusted $25,000, I can see the merit of that, but uh, we can deal with that, I think, best at another time. Uh, Mr. Strasburg, do you wish to respond? Yes, uh, maybe someone in convocation will uh, uh, second my, uh, my proposed amendment. Mr. Sharda is seconding your amendment. So, Thank you. We have a motion to amend. I think they should they should be separately. Uh, Twenty five thousand dollars will be one amendment in the second amendment will exempt into class actions until further study by the uh, by the committee. Okay, I think that's pretty clear. Thank you for that. So. Um, I will have to open the floor for a debate on the amendment. Prior to doing that, I think we'll take the coffee break. <laughs> the, the phone is open. Um, so there is an amendment by Mr. Strasburg, seconded by Mr. Sharda. Mr. Barrow, do you want to state what the amendment is? And open the floor to those who feel we need to address it. The veterans the amendment is as follows, that the $25,000 absolute limit be indexed to the consumer price index, and that the capital regulatory approach and the proposed amendments to the rules and bylaws not apply to referral fees in class actions. So Mr. Mercer, you wish to address the answer? I want to say two things briefly. First of all, it's not that we didn't consider class actions. Uh, uh, one of our members uh, uh, of our working group is expert in the area and the consultation uh, dealt with class action so it wasn't that it wasn't considered but secondly I think the concern is mostly misplaced because the rule deals with referral of a client from one licensee to another licensee and much of what Mr. Strasburg referred to isn't about referring clients the American uh, cases which are referred in quotes to Canadian lawyers are not referring clients obviously because they are different plaintiffs, different representative plaintiffs. What they are is referring cases and referring the workup of a case. So in an interesting way it's the referral of a fact pattern as opposed to the referral of a client. The same is true with respect to carriage motions where class action lawyers fight over who is going to move forward as the uh, lead case and share uh, fees then with the others who stand down. In that case, uh, it is not necessarily the case, although it could be, that you refer the representative plaintiff, but rather you're reaching an agreement to stand down your client's case as against another client's case and have your client then be a class member. While there might be unusual circumstances where this rule affects class actions, it mostly shouldn't. And so I say the motion is unnecessary. As to the indexing, uh, it, it's not a bad idea, but frankly, it's a complication that we shouldn't, uh, uh, in my submission, deal with at this point. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak to the uh, amendment, proposed amendment? Any the conference is no longer in lecture mode. On the telephone, does anybody wish to address the amendment? Mr. Strauss? 
Sure. You heard Mr. Mercer's uh, comments. Did he wish to respond to that at all? Yes, I, uh, I, I don't understand why there was a word in the report about class actions. And Mr. Uh, Mercer misapprehends the issues. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the um, uh, clients uh, were the, the, the people from Nova Scotia have a client in Ontario, and the lawyers in the U.S. have a client in on, Ontario that registered with her office. So he, he's just mistaken. It's the first time he's mistaken. <laughs> uh, but not for the last. <laughs> I'm glad you qualified that. Thank you, Mr. Strasburg. Uh, is there anybody else? Uh, who wishes to address this matter? Mr. Callahan. Um, I, uh, I, I do uh, class actions, but I, in fact, the co author probably the leading text in the area. And there is, there is a bit of a, and I know Mr. McDowell will sure. <laughs> Undoubtedly, Mr. McDowell will refer to that next time he's at the podium. But the, um, there is a bit of a concern in this so far as the courts. I think Mr. Strasburg is right. The courts do take a parental view as to costs uh, and it's in their jurisdiction and I just I, I, I don't know whether it's been properly considered as to the interplay between the jurisdiction under the statute and our sub sub delegated legislative role and I just worry a little bit because we have seen the courts uh, step in in respect of a number of areas, particularly in the costs area, um, and it's it's and I'm not because I do the defense side. I am not versed on how the plaintiffs deal with this because it's usually done between the plaintiffs' counsel and the court. So I can't I can't <coughs> express, express anything that Mr. Strasburg is probably still remains the the leading person in that area. So you'd have to listen to him on this. But it does there is an element here. Of jurisdiction as to whether we should not pause and consider that, given the fact that the courts do take a parental view with respect to costs and class actions, and it is it is under the supervision of the court, and so the, the mischief we're talking about is already being addressed. And they say to Harvey, "You want to be your fee." Is he bringing? Right. Uh, not uh, hearing any other voices on the telephone or. Have one other comment. No longer in lecture mode. I have one other comment here. Can you yes. hear me? Mr. Chef, go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, you presented the amendment as as one item. I, I'm under the impression that Mr. Strasburg suggested uh, two amendments be voted on separately. Maybe, maybe I have that wrong, but that's what I thought he said. That's right. All right. So I think you, you want to be dealing with two separate amendments voted on separately. All right, uh, thank you. Mr. Charter, are you prepared to second both of them? Sure. All right, then uh, thank you for that clarification, Mr. Chef. Uh, so hearing no other voices, seeing no other hands, we will put the first proposed amendment to a vote, which uh, Mr. Vera was the one relating to the CPI index. Do you want to just state it again? That the $25,000 absolute limit be indexed to the consumer price index. Um, so moved by Mr. Strasburg, seconded by Mr. Sharda. All in favor? Um, a very small number of hands against in the room. So for those on the phone, the, the room clearly uh, defeats the motion. Um, unless anybody wishes to state otherwise on the telephone, I think it's clear that the motion has failed. So with that, we'll move to the second one. That the cap and regulatory approach and the proposed amendments to the rules and bylaws not apply to referral fees in class actions. All in favor in the room? Uh, those against? All right, again, there's a clear uh, vote against in the room, so I think the motion again fails. Thank you. Um, we'll then put the main motion. So this is the motion, Mr. Mercer, moved by you, seconded by... Treasurer, can I order? A recorded vote? For the main motion. Yes. Yes, I'm okay with that. So we'll do a recorded vote. 
A roll call vote for the main motion, um, which is found at paragraph 22 on page 419 of the uh, board books. Mr. Barrow, would you call the roll? Mr. Anand. Abstain. Mr. Beach, could you just repeat what your vote was? Against. Against. Uh, Mr. Bickford. Against. Uh, Mr. Braithwaite. In favor. Mr. Brett. Or. Mr. Bird. Abstain. Mr. Callahan. Against. Uh, Ms. Chrétien. In favor. Ms. Clement. Four. Mr. Cooper. Four. Ms. Corbier. Four. Ms. Corsetti. Four. Ms. Krieger. Four. Ms. Donnelly. Four. Mr. Earnshaw. Four. Mr. Epstein. Four. Mr. Evans. Four. Mr. Falconer. Four. Mr. Ferrier. Four. Ms. Goh. Four. Mr. Goldblatt. Four. Mr. Groya. Four. Ms. Hay. Four. Ms. Hartman. Four. Ms. Horvath. Four. Mr. Krishna. Four. Mr. Lori. Four. Ms. Leeper. Against. Mr. Lem. Four. Mr. Lerner. Four. Ms. Lippa. Four. Ms. McLean. Four. Mr. McDowell. Four. Ms. McGrath. Four. Ms. Morali. Against. Mr. Mercer. Four. Ms. Murchie. Four. Ms. Nishikawa. Four. Uh, Ms. Richardson. Four. Ms. Riche. Four. Mr. Rosenthal. Four. Mr. Sharda. Against. Mr. Shad. Mr. Sheff, you were there a moment ago. Sorry, four. I uh, forgot to take it off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Sakan. Against. Mr. Spurgeon. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Strasberg. Four. Mr. Strasberg. Against. Uh, Mr. Troister. Four. Mr. Udell. Four. Ms. Vesprey. Ms. Walker. Four. Mr. Wardle. Four. Is there anyone whose name I haven't called? The conference is in lecture mode. So the motion passes, 41 in favor, 8 against, and 2 abstentions. Thank you very much. We'll move to the next item on the agenda, which is the Human Rights Monitoring Group Interventions. Ms. Donald. Thank you, Treasurer. The motion found at tab 5.1 of board books at page 509 is that convocation approve the letters and public statements in 12 cases <coughs> of 14 individual lawyers and 27 uh, judges and prosecutors. The interventions relate to 11 different countries. All the requests for intervention fall within the mandate of the Human Rights Monitoring Group. There are no concerns with the sources of the quality of the sources used for the reports. In each case, 
the lawyer and judges' human rights have been violated as a result of the discharge of their legitimate professional duties. The violations or persecutions involve maltreatment while in detention in China, arrest, conviction, and detention in Kazakhstan, arrest and detention in Zambia, arrest and administrative conviction in Russia, dismissal of 227 judges and prosecutors in Turkey, detention in Sudan, convictions in Belarus, and tragically, the four murders and one attempt, attempted murder. The murders are the murder of Mohammed John Giani in Pakistan, who was one of the lawyers that had survived <coughs> a suicide bomb attack on the Shabkadar courts in March of 2016. The murders of Tatiana Popova and Valery Rybalchenko in the Ukraine. The murder of criminal lawyer Jan Freddy Konka Valbuena and the attempted murder of criminal lawyer Orge Enrique Balcazar in Colombia. And the murder of Mia Mascarenas Green in the Philippines, who was gunned down while in the presence of her three children and the children's nanny. The children and the nanny survived, were unharmed. Ms. Mia Mascarenas Green was murdered before her children's eyes. You will recall that only in February of 2017 that we intervened in the case of Arlan, Arlan Castaneda, another Filipino lawyer. The motion is to approve the letters and public statements in these cases. <coughs> it is moved by me and seconded by Ms. Go. Thank you. Uh, any comment or questions on the telephone? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. <clears throat> any comments or questions on the phone? Hearing nobody, uh, I'll put it to a vote. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Anyone opposed on the phone? The motion is carried. Thank you, Ms. Donnelly. Thank you, Treasurer. The conference is in lecture mode. I call upon uh, Ms. Leeper to give us an update on the governance task force. This is a brief update on our work. As you know from earlier reports, we have divided our work into smaller, shorter process issues and some longer, more involved policy possibilities for governance here at the Law Society. Uh, with respect to the shorter term issues, you'll recall that in February we talked about the paralegal election and the lawyer venture election and trying to bring those into sync. As you know, there's an ongoing consultation period that ends tomorrow, so we should be back with the results of that consultation and a decision for you to make likely in June. We also had reported to you about the paralegal term limit, and again, that will be coming forward sooner rather than later. In relation to voting periods, because we were suggesting a together kind of election, we were not going to propose a further shortening of the election period of time to allow for any additional work that needs to be carried out by the election officer. So that's the shorter things. Some of the shorter to medium things, board evaluation, we're continuing to look at a number of potential instruments with the view to seeing whether board evaluation processes could help us in the sense of board excellence and whether or not it's appropriate. And it's not an obvious answer because of our size and because of the nature of our work. However, we're continuing to look at that and we'll be reporting to you on any recommendations. Um, hope to do that in June. We have now spoken through staff to all three emeritus treasurers as part of the emeritus treasurer review that was mandated by the first round of governance reforms. So we will again be reporting to you further on the outcome of those conversations and we'd like to thank the emeritus treasurers for participating. Uh, advice to the treasurer, at the request of the treasurer, we were asked to look at a number of governance type matters that would require decisions by this body, but something to assist in the sense of how convocation operates at a, a more granular level. These include things like the use of the Lamont Centre for meetings of convocation. 
um, I would say that our task force is generally in favour of that as the permanent home of convocation. I'm not certain that that's ready to be decided, but that's kind of where we're leaning and where we will likely be giving whatever advice that we can on that to the treasurer. Uh, venture education about rules of procedure, we see that as a very logical and good idea for us <coughs> venture education. We were asked to consider the continuation of designated seating and convocation for certain committee chairs. I don't think we've landed totally on that one, but I, I had the sense we weren't totally thinking that that was necessary as an ongoing matter, but again, that will also hinge on the decision of where we will be sitting. <laughs> McDowell, could you please come over here? <laughs> Uh, work ahead. So the broader governance issues, and we've had a few conversations with a number of ventures who've asked us about this and, and where we're going. I think the key point here is there is no predetermined outcome at all. We are walking, not running. We are looking for best practices and the evidence that will help us take on whatever transformation we might recommend a convocation in a very um, well collaborative way, really. Uh, and we haven't completed the evidence gathering, so we're, we can't even tell you we've got a sense in the room of where or what any such reform might look like. But I think the important thing here is it's not going to be our appetite that determines any of those changes. It will be convocation's appetite, and we will need to have lots of participation about what it is, what are the possibilities, what would serve the future of the Law Society, and we're hoping to come to you with a concrete plan for how that will happen in June, but with those conversations really to start happening in the fall. Oh, uh, the names. Um, our report touches on questions of the ongoing nomenclature that we use, whether or not we're accessible. We've mentioned this before. Um, I think there is an appetite around the table of our task force, at least, to have uh, consideration given to modernizing the name of the Law Society, perhaps the name of our officials, perhaps the name of our board. Uh, so we think there's merit to explore that. We're not yet coming forward with saying, and we may never be the group that says, here's what we think should happen, but we do think it ought to be explored. So uh, with that, Treasurer, I think I'll complete my report. Thank you, Mr. Maybe I could just add before you go and uh, welcome any comments, but to point out again that we are going to be having a, a day uh, in the fall, um, sort of a mini retreat, as it were, and we will be dedicating a good portion of that to a broader discussion of governance at that time. So um, we'll be able to talk in, a, in an informal and more extensive way about governance uh, at that time. <coughs> Are there any uh, questions uh, for Ms. Lieber? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Any questions on the telephone? No? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lieber. Uh, Mr. Earnshaw. The conference is in lecture mode. Federation of Law Societies of Canada. Let the record show that I survived an attempt by Mr. Falconer to trip me on my way to the podium. <laughs> uh, you'll find the uh, report to convocation on the Federation of Law Societies of Canada in your board books at page 692. I'm indebted to Mr. Barrow, who is the author of that report. I think you'll find it quite comprehensive, and I don't propose to review it with any uh, great particularity. I have uh, been on the agenda a couple of times before, uh, and I'm doggedly determined to make the report this time that what I was unable to make in January and February. A lot has happened uh, since I was appointed uh, to the Council, effective as of last December, and uh, most of it uh, is summarized in, in the report you have before you. Uh, we met in Quebec City in March uh, during a howling blizzard and uh, uh, managed to uh, have a quorum that was able to stay and address a number of issues that um, I, th I think would best be summarized uh, by reference to uh, three things. The strategic plan uh, that was first uh, developed in um, a session which con was conducted in uh, November of last year at St. Andrews by the Sea and resulted in a number of formulations and drafts which eventually came uh, before the Council in March. Um, 
uh, an international <coughs> engagement uh, plan uh, that uh, is something that this law society has been requesting for some time and uh, also the Truth and Reconciliation Advisory Committee. These are by no means the only agenda items, but uh, they are the ones that are uh, first and foremost and that I wanted to bring to your attention. So the strategic plan, uh, not yet finalized, uh, was presented in penultimate draft form in March. Uh, the March meeting included not only a meeting of council, but also a CEO's forum at which Mr. Lapper was present and a president's forum at which uh, our treasurer was present <coughs> and which I also attended. Each of those two forums um, provided commentary with respect to the draft strategic plan uh, and we, that is the Law Society of Upper Canada, were asked particularly to submit comments in writing. Others were invited to do so, but I would say that our comments were probably the most substantive there was general agreement uh, that we had um, uh, uh, three thrusts in the strategic plan uh, that um, we should go forward with. And these are that the Federation be a knowledge leader and effectively share information and facilitate collaboration. Secondly, that the Federation identify and promote best practices in professional regulation and third, that the Federation demonstrate excellence in governance and service delivery. Uh, there was a, a recognition uh, by the Council in March uh, that uh, these may not be the most ambitious of strategic objectives, but on the other hand, the Federation is not accustomed to dealing with a strategic plan at all, and it was felt that this was a significant leap forward. For the forthcoming year, three priorities were identified. Uh, these are uh, and will be the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee Calls to Action Advisory Committee. That's a mouthful. Uh, but that is, uh, as the name implies, an advisory committee that was struck at the December meeting and was populated largely at the March meeting. Our own uh, venture, Diane Corbier, is a member of that advisory committee. Another appointee from, uh, recommended from Ontario, Mr. Stuart Woodkey, General Counsel of the Assembly of First Nations, uh, was also appointed to that committee, which will now proceed under the uh, chairmanship of Karen Wilford uh, and uh, will be meeting throughout the balance of this year and until recommendations can be brought forward. The second uh, priority for this coming year is the completion of the National Committee on Accreditation Program Review and how to address the recommendations that will arise from that review. Um, and the third is the efforts of the working group established to examine Law Society anti-money laundering rules for the profession and the approaches for how those rules are enforced. That working group was newly established last December uh, and is co-chaired by our <coughs> own Mr. Barrow. Um, this month, the uh, National Requirement Review Committee issued its report. Um, Mr. Peter Wardle has had a, a big hand in the uh, preparation and delivery of that report. It affirms the jurisdiction of the Approval Committee, um, a subcommittee, a standing committee of the Federation on which I serve and in respect of which Ms. Politza, who is here today, was my predecessor. Uh, it affirms its jurisdiction to address many of the process issues related to review of programs against the national requirement. And uh, so I commend to your reading not only uh, our own report, uh, which uh, is in board books, as I said, but also a report that is generated by the president of the Federation, Mr. Maurice Piet and which has been posted in the resources section uh, of your board books. A person reading the two reports closely will notice certain tensions uh, between the two, and I might say that uh, the relationship between this law society <coughs> and the Federation has been somewhat strained. Uh, over the past couple of years, there have been differences of opinion, uh, and there are still a number of issues that um, uh, remain 
uh, somewhat thorny between us, um, but uh, they are being addressed. Uh, and for example, the international engagement plan of which I spoke <coughs> is the first time that there was uh, in the history of the organization of the Federation ever an international engagement plan that was tabled and discussed um, at, the, uh, at the council meeting. Um, the concern that has been expressed from the Law Society has been that uh, the international engagement is a costly exercise and that the merits of attending at some of the international events, such as the opening of courts in England and France, for example, uh, do not have any apparent benefit uh, to the membership of the Federation, uh, such as ourselves. Uh, that uh, robust debate took place, uh, and essentially I would summarize the result as follows. It was agreed that the international engagement plan would go forward for this coming year, but that there was a real concern not only expressed by your humble correspondent, but also by others at the uh, meeting, uh, to the effect that there should be uh, thorough reports of the result of the international engagement with an emphasis on whether or not they actually benefit the member societies, and with a view to reviewing the engagement plan in years going forward to see whether uh, it's appropriate that all of the international outreach in which the Federation now engages is appropriate and should continue. Uh, so I think, uh, Treasurer, I um, uh, have conveyed the, the <coughs> gist of what you and I attended in March and uh, from which we escaped by train through the blizzard. Uh, I'm open to any questions that any benchers may pose. Thank you, Mr. Earnshaw. Uh, Mr. Brett has questions. You can go there, sure. Um, so my question uh, uh, directed uh, Treasurer through to Mr. Earnshaw relates to the travel and expense policy uh, for senior staff and for the executive. And just to put a bit of context, and this was raised um, with the uh, Federation some time ago. Um, in the meantime, we had a look at here at the Law Society, we had a look at some of our policies and, and put in place some changes to make them uh, much more responsible and and so I guess what I'm wondering is is that has that issue now been addressed and if it hasn't been addressed when can we expect that it will be addressed okay. so yes the uh, um, the travel policy is an issue that was uh, one that had been raised uh, by the law society as part of our questioning of amongst other things the cost of the international engagement and uh, there, there, is, uh, um, there was a, a partial policy in place which was uh, brought forward as a result of our inquiry. As Mr. Brett will know, and this may have uh, uh, informed his question, uh, one of the uh, improvements of the Federation over the past couple of years since uh, the governance policy was put in place with considerable effort and input from this law society uh, is that uh, it now goes through a much more rigorous budgeting process than it ever did in the past. And part of that process is to produce a draft budget, which was done, I believe, in February of this year. And then that draft budget is circulated to the member societies, including ours. And so it came before our Audit and Finance Committee, uh, which identified not only the issue that Mr. Brett raises, but also three others uh, that were then conveyed to the Audit and Finance Committee of the Federation, on which Mr. Lapper serves, um, and uh, uh, as a result, the, there were revisions made to the draft budget, which was presented in March. Uh, there will be a further uh, presentation of that budget, which will come before our Audit Committee in its May meeting. Um, but as I understand it, the, the actual travel policy has not yet been put in place. Um, I would say that the international engagement plan that we saw and debated uh, and that led to the proposal to uh, scrutinize that aspect of um, the activities of the Federation going forward would lead to, uh, in, in the natural course of things, the establishment of a policy. I also know that the policy that was adapted by the Law Society here and is applicable to our uh, 
treasurer and staff uh, was uh, shared with the Federation, so they have that as a precedent. But it's not in place yet to answer your direct question. Any other questions in the room? Mr. Conway. <coughs> Hi, uh, thank you, Treasurer. Um, I want to make one comment. As someone who has uh, has led the Federation in recent years and who, someone who has also served as Treasurer and have attended many of these international conferences, um, either on behalf of our own law society or on behalf of the Federation. And uh, with all due respect, I think the, the debate about international travel and international attendance at these conferences has been cast in a somewhat parochial manner. And I say it for, for, for this specific reason. At a lot of these international bar association conferences and regulatory conferences of, uh, among regula regulators around the world, Canada is often asked to participate because of its successful experience in such things as the National Mobility Agreement, uh, in regu regulating in the public interest as opposed to the, to the interests of the profession. And the Canadian regulatory system is often used as a model uh, for other countries. And we contribute, it's, it, so the question shouldn't be, what does this law society get out of uh, the international travel that is engaged in by members of uh, the Federation? But rather, the question should be more broadly framed, and that is, what is Canada, what is the Canadian regulatory system give, giving to other jurisdictions in the world, including the United States, developing countries? Uh, and uh, I, I hope that in, in, the, in the weeks and months to come, as this issue gets debated uh, more fully, that convocation will keep that in mind, that we as a country contribute greatly to uh, the development of uh, of uh, modern regulatory approaches, uh, not just in our own country, but in, in other countries as well. And I would, I, would, I, I, would, I, I would suggest that it would be very regrettable if we simply uh, framed the issue as what do we get out of it, as opposed to what are we giving to, to others. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Mr. Conway. Mr. McGrath. Just very briefly, maybe I can do it from here. I just want to echo what Mr. Conway has said. Um, I've attended some of these meetings when I was president of the Canadian Bar Association, and indeed Canada is looked up to as a model, and our participation in those conferences really do help developing countries. Thank you. Mr. Falcon? Yes, Treasurer, I just want to make sure I understood what Mr. Brett raised. I didn't hear Mr. Brett or understand Mr. Brett to be raising the question of the merits of participation or the important role Canada may have to play on the international front from a regulatory point of view. What I heard him to raise is the notion of transparency and structure and accountability, which is if there are going to be serious expenses incurred in respect of international travel and the like, we want to make sure that uh, you know we're in 2017 and that we are accountable uh, uh, for the fees that we spend, whether it's here uh, in Toronto or in Ontario at the Law Society, or when we're a Federation member, a major uh, subsidizer of the Federation. That's my issue, and I agree with everything Mr. Conway said in terms of the role of Canada, but that doesn't take away from the importance of accountability and proper rules governing expenses, which is the only thing I heard Mr. Brett to talk about. I just don't think we should conflate the issues, because if you conflate them, you risk actually doing harm to the objective, which is just to create proper rules for, for expenditures. Risk saying this, Mr. Faulkner, I agree with you. You must be right because I agree with you too. That's, 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 that candidate is a treasure. And Mr. Conway, uh, uh, I was at the debate about the discussion about this at council, and your point is well taken. It was well taken at council too. I think that there, there was there wasn't a discussion that we didn't have a role to play as. Uh, as a country that is often looked to as an example and to provide that, that benefit, but it was directed more towards the issue of accountability because ideas have been raised uh, about a number of uh, uh, expenses and trips that seem to, uh, at least on the face, have much less value to anybody um, than, uh, than that the, the justified the expense. So this is, I think, I think Mr. Faulkner's right 
uh, in saying <coughs> the discussion was really about accountability, which involves what's the benefit on both sides, um, and what's the accountability uh, with respect to expenses. And indeed, if I may, Treasurer, uh, that was my understanding of the conclusion of the debate, which was that we will go forward with the international engagement as we have in the past, but there will be more robust reporting. There will be a critical eye uh, to the benefit as defined by yourself and Mr. Conway uh, with a view to refining that process going forward. And I also agree with Mr. Faulkner that the the question of a travel policy is uh, one of accountability and transparency, quite unrelated to the uh, nature and extent of the international engagement. Thank you. Mr. Porter, you had your hand up. I know you've just returned from some international sure, travel uh, stuff. Uh, supporting Mr. Conway, and I think that the sense of the House, but uh, you as Treasurer will know, and Mr. Conway knows, that one of the great advantages of being Treasurer is that you learn what's going on in the world and you bring to this table in subsequent discussions uh, your experience as to views elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We've had in the last three or four years great discussions about what's going on in England concerning financing law firms, what's going on in Australia concerning review of the power of uh, bar associations, and um, it is an immense resource that you can listen to the world and bring its knowledge to us, and it's very valuable. Is there anybody else in the room or on the telephone? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Anybody on the telephone wish to address this issue relating to the Federation, or any issue relating to the Federation? You're in silence. I'll thank you, Mr. Earnshaw, for the presentation. Thank you, The Treasurer. conference is in lecture mode. So that concludes the public portion of the meeting, and so we will then proceed to the camera.